Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. I hope that uh, coffee was good and now we are continuing with um, the next session and I want to invite here uh, four museums from four university museums. Um, and please, Ghent Museum uh, and Museum of Louvain, Alar Pearson and Bergen University Museum. Thank you. Please. So we are going to start with the um, Ghent University Museum, please. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Marianne Doom, but I will not bring you Doom, don't, don't worry. I will bring you uh, an innovative new uh, mu uh, university museum um, of the city of Ghent, so the Ghent University. Um, we opened two years ago now, uh, 2020, um, and we already uh, were holding a big collection of uh, the Ghent University since its foundation, so roughly more than 200 years. Um, and we were allowed to open the very first university museum, so that meant that we did not have any kind of blueprint to work towards, and we had a lot of freedom to create uh, and think about uh, what kind of museum we wanted to be and to create this new um, uh, museum, think about our societal role, what did we want to mean, mean towards our uh, audience, towards, towards our university, and so on. Um, we came up with a museum of doubt, and I am uh, sure that by the end of the presentation you will understand uh, why it's called uh, like that. Our main mission, I would say, is to activate the critical citizenship. The big green button. Yes? No. Yes. Um, we are homed uh, in the, a university campus in the middle of, the, of uh, Ghent, which is a very cultural and vibrant city with uh, 10 uh, other museums. Uh, we are also located within the Botanical Garden, which already lowers the threshold uh, to enter. And this uh, university campus is a mixed-use building, so it, there's already a mix of visitor uh, flows with uh, students, academic staff and our visitors. So that already um, automatically brings this vibrant, activating uh, atmosphere. And we totally uh, abuse that kind of uh, active uh, atmosphere that is there. How do we um, position ourselves? No. I'm just in doubt, but I <laughs> <laughs> Yes, how do we position ourselves? Um, we position ourselves within the academic community, within our university, but also within um, the, the cultural and the museum field, and especially on that kind of crossover between both fields which puts us nowhere uh, and everywhere, and we really love that kind of position. It gives us a lot of freedom to work and really go and play uh, with what it means to be a university uh, museum. It also gives us uh, the right to become this like bridge builder in between uh, fields and, and reach out to the, to the other side. We call ourselves the uh, Forum for Science, Doubt and Art, uh, and I want to focus on a couple of words here. Forum is for us a very uh, important work, uh, word to uh, claim what we stand for. We are a, a democratic and open uh, place where we invite different kinds of voices. Uh, so we are a polyphonic uh, place where not only the scientific voice is heard, but all kinds of voices are invited to go into dialogue with us. Doubt for us stands for uh, anti-dogmatic thinking. Um, so we do advocate uh, anti-dogmatic thinking and a scientific thinking, uh, but we invite and we listen and we do not, um, uh, or, or we validate also other voices and invite them to come and discuss it with us. Art that will become clear uh, in a bit. Ah, the green one. The green one. The green. Thank you. 
So when you enter uh, GAM, uh, what you do not see uh, the the big achievements of the university of uh, or the big achievements of our researchers. The first thing that you encounter entering GAM is the word chaos. Uh, and we want to cause this kind of friction uh, in our visitor to make them a bit maybe confused. And uh, why do we do that? Because we want to uh, activate their, mi their minds and we want to uh, share with them what scientific thinking is all about. Uh, and we want to um, activate their critical uh, thinking mindsets. So the word chaos is, chaos is the first uh, thing uh, that they meet. Uh, also see uh, the very in uh, intimate scenography where we want to uh, create this atmosphere for open uh, dialogue, but also of uh, reflection. So no uh, science is fun principle, but really the scientific thinking and the scientific process that's our uh, main uh, focus. Doubt, as I said, uh, stands for us for uh, anti-dogmatic thinking. So we do not proclaim truths. We do not um, uh, just put forward uh, the scientific output that was produced by our researchers, but we go with our visitors inside the heads of the scientists and we follow them along the path. How do you come from a question to uh, a hypothesis? Uh, how do you do that research? And uh, not just uh, the success stories, but also all the failures, the mistakes um, and, um, that are just inherent uh, uh, of science and the scientific process as well. As such, we try to make uh, science and scientists feel more approachable to, and recognizable to our uh, visitors. We also um, try to um, uh, confrontate our visitors with some the fixes they might have about science uh, and scientific thinking. For example, that uh, creative thinking and creativity, even imagination, is part of uh, uh, science. Uh, and it's not a rigid thinking part, but you can also have emotions evolved uh, within the scientific research. Um, so imagination is also one of our uh, themes. As said, uh, art is also part of our uh, baseline, so science, doubt and art. So we also invite artists in on commission or we show their work uh, loans from other museums. Um, and we approach those, uh, those artists um, as researchers as well. So we focus uh, together um, with them on their processes. They also start from very similar questions as scientists and we follow them along, uh, along their thinking paths and we show their perspective and their approaches as, as equally uh, valuable as the uh, scientific uh, processes and thinking paths. Of course, they bring something else to reality. They bring something else to the story, but we put them next to one another without um, um, uh, taking any kind of uh, stance uh, and we put them next to each other so that we can define better what it is and what it isn't. So uh, artists are very, very welcome um, in our museum and that translates as well in our, uh, uh, um, our graphic um, identity, our visual identity, which is also a juxtaposition of science and art um, and in which we want to um, also, again, uh, trigger these kind of questions in our visitors of what, what are they looking at exactly. Of course, we also have temporary exhibitions and we choose teams uh, that trigger our visitors and that makes us uh, relevant today and relevant to youngsters uh, because they are uh, one of our main uh, target audiences. Also in the temporary exhibitions, we juxtapose these different dis disciplines. So multidisciplinarity is an important word for us. So we juxtapose art and science next to one another to evoke questions. I often say we want to uh, make our visitors leave with more questions than that they came in. That art uh, also um, puts itself in the botanical garden. So we make artistic roots through uh, the botanical garden in our temporary displays. Um, we take advantage of our unique position as a university, so we involve a lot of students in different kinds of ways. They do uh, internships, of course, uh, doing either sonography or uh, collection, collection research. Um, but we also have a big young board. They are part of our museum. They are not uh, just visitors. No, they are part of uh, our museum team. Uh, on the left you see our MUST team, the museum student team. 
30 very enthusiastic uh, students from uh, more than 20 disciplines, from engineering to art historians. Um, and they are, for us, not just uh, um, yeah, there for the fun, but we ask them a lot of questions, we involve them in a lot of uh, processes in our museum. And they give a lot. Of, they, they also give a lot of in return. So, uh, for example, they they give guided tours or they are advocates on uh, cultural events. We have a program that reaches out uh, to the diversity of the, the the diverse target groups that we want to meet. So we don't just stay uh, inside the museum, of course, but we also break out both. Uh, uh, physically and digitally, so we have a podcast, for example. Again, students are very important for us to break out of the museum walls. Thank you very much. <laughs> and hope to see you in Ghent. And now, please, the uh, Museum Louvain. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anne. I'm the director of Musée L. Musée L is also a university museum in a very special place called Louvain, but in fact, it is louvain la neuve It is a completely new city in the French part of Belgium. So I will present... Um, shortly the museum and I, I choose to have uh, three parts so the first part will be con uh, will be devoted to a general presentation uh, the characteristic uh, I, what I call the DN of our museum the second part uh, I will present the challenge and the achievement of this new narrative and the third part, I present the new challenge, their condition, and also conclusion. Our museum was opened four years ago. So green. You can already see the building. It's a very special building. It is. It was before the um, a library a big library, so the scientific and te technology library. So our challenge was to renovate this uh, library and uh, transform into a museum. So Museel is a university museum, but it is a fully public museum. It is located in Belgium and it is in a first pedestrian city in Europe and a very uh, young city. So that is also uh, quite a uh, special, special uh, feature. So we renovated the building, but in fact the concrete um, uh, building was not really touched. We transformed this building, who was the emblem of our university, because maybe you know, but we had to leave Louvain, so the Flemish part, to build a new city. And so that is one of what that was the main uh, building of our new university. And in fact, to renovate this building was for our university really the opportunity to protect a splendid postmodernist architectural patrimony. And be because we renovate this building, we serve also sustainability aim. It was the opportunity to, to, have, to think about a new energy performance, LED lighting, natural material for design, special isolation, glass and ventilation. So what are our intention? And we, of course, we um, work very hard and with patience for new program. So our intention was to create an original guest house for emotional experience through arts and science. To be a welcome place open to all, from children to university students, from social association to tourists. But also to be a research laboratory and a learning center for collection. We have very huge and very eclectic collection 
from the prehistory to contemporary periods, from more or less all the culture, and uh, our main focus, it is on art collection. So it's quite different from my colleague from GAM, because we have less scientific collection, but we have a lot of, uh, uh, for example, popular art, extra uh, Europe. Um, we have uh, a very amazing collection of a stamp, what we call a stamp, a graving, and it's, it's more or less 30,000 um, pieces in the inventory. So how we succeed to do that? We choose to have a thematic approach with question, open question. The main question was, what drives humanity to create and to invent? So it is a very general question. And with this big question, we try to enter into the collection. We succeed to that uh, by using the dialogue. Dialogue between science, art, but during, uh, between the different periods and also the, between the different uh, culture. And even if we are a um, university museum, we focus on emotional and experimentation. So that is why we have three labs for sensitivity, discovery, practical experimentation. We have inclusive, inclusive movie, combining animation and interview with university research and young people. We try also to invent a new way of team management, because I really think that when you co-construct, so we, when we put different kind of people with different kind of uh, way to think and skill, we are becoming more intelligent. And so we try to do that in a very dynamic and social workshop. It has, uh, it needs trust, generosity and full communication. And it is always to be, to, to be built. It's never a rich. So we sharing different kind of skill, as I mentioned already, and uh, all the department work together to build this new narrative uh, uh, vision of our new museum. What is our baseline is this to feel at home in the museum. So to be an attractive and a comfortable place for everyone, for students, but for children, and also for academic, of, of course, as well as families. So we try to create a proximity place without needing high-level education to feel well and being open. And for me, what it is more important, it is to be curious, because it is really the main, the main drive that can... Uh, is in action when you enter a collection. Oh, go, oh my goodness. So, <laughs> I will go for it. Sorry. Second part, the challenge. <laughs> achievement <laughs> and new narration. So, <laughs> as we want to be accessible, we try to invent different approach, but also we will we like to, uh, to feel the complexity of our actual words to promote and encourage the critical and sensitive thinking. We think that it is an opportunity to be an open public university museum. Because academic and non-academic belong to different worlds. They are speaking sometimes different language. They have different co code and purpose. And also artwork have their own language. And so university and museum, they are both concerned with transmission, knowledge and research. So we have a lot of space to dialogue and to meet. So how we succeed? especially by collaborating, by project, uh, with researcher, with uh, artist, with scientific, and by using the uh, 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 transdisciplinarity thinking. And work directly with the object in the storage. That is, for me, something very important. Third part. 
new challenge for our museum to, to be this open place for publics and university uh, person. We really want to be and to catalyze for socialized sorry, change. To be this special space for co-creating between artists, artists and researchers, between academics and students and large public. But also we are really engaged to promote new narrative of resilience within ongoing social and environmental transformation. For example, here we have what we call a kind of mindfulness um, experience um, inside the museum with an historian of art, but also somebody who are specialized for this approach. So I really believe that place like this can be place to breathe and to be because, become more resilient. So condition to develop Musiel, we choose the quality. And for me, it means less is more. We want to, to be a place to breathe, to share emotion, to continue to research, to question the society where we are living in. So we continue rigorous involvement with the collection. So we have a big project on online databases, work with documentation, publication and research. Conclusion, Museel keeps moving, searching, exploring. Sometimes we fail and sometimes we achieve. That needs staff commitment with patience and dedication. But we are in charge of an incredible heritage who has seen a lot of things to tell us today. We are working with four essential assets. And I will uh, conclude it by this little uh, synthesis. Encountering heart humanize us, enable us to develop quality for dialogue and peace, to open new paths that are already beaten by artists, researchers, poets, spiritual sages from all the culture. And I dedicate this to the Ukrainian people and especially our colleagues in the museum. Thank you very much. Um, please, Alan Pearson. Hello, uh, my name is Stanley Rossum. I am the head of research and collections of the Allard Pearson. I only have eight slides. Uh, I also <laughs> want to introduce my colleagues, uh, Els van der Plas, the director of the Allard Pearson since a little bit more than a month, and Petra Hage, you can wave a little bit, who is our uh, communications officer, who will, uh, I'm very welcome, I'm very glad that they're also here. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about uh, the exhibitions that we have uh, on in the Allard Pearson, because there, there are many, I want to focus specifically on why and how it's important to be part of a university and what it can bring uh, to a museum. So the Allard Pearson is uh, a medium-sized museum, a knowledge institute, but the, its collections are huge and very varied. It goes from archaeological objects uh, to collections on Jewish culture, natural history collections, graphic arts collections, some of them of living uh, designers and writers, the music center uh, of the Netherlands, but also uh, a whole uh, uh, museum of computer uh, archaeology uh, are all part of this uh, institution. And it creates opportunities, but also creates challenges. Um, we are very fortunate to be located in the very heart of uh, Amsterdam. You see this whole row of buildings on the left. This is all part of uh, the building. Um, this creates an opportunity also for the university to really open up towards the audience, the people of Amsterdam, but also the students and the researchers, the, the many tourists that, that pass by. On the right, you see uh, another location. This is the Artist Library. It is a 19th century building with 
uh, one of the most important natural history collections, uh, I think, in the world. Uh, and, and, and this building and the collection are all inside and they're all managed by uh, the Alec Pearson as well. So um, we have really a very wide range of activities. Uh, I name only a couple. On the, on the left, you see some of our, our activities we started uh, during COVID, which is, of course, to do presentations on the collection online. And what you see is a gastronomical workshop on how people cooked in the 17th century. Uh, people got the recipe beforehand, and they were invited to, to join uh, these two uh, uh, now histories, historians on, on, on gastronomy to, to create a 17th century dish uh, together. Uh, on the right, bottom right, you see a young girl who is aspiring to become uh, an archaeologist. We have an archaeo hotspot uh, where uh, everybody can just walk in and, 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 and work with real artifacts, real archaeological finds from the city, archaeolog city archaeologist of Amsterdam, where they can put together uh, 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 yeah, broken, broken pottery, try to put it back together and then give it back to the archaeologist who can then uh, continue the work on it. Of course, we are a place for students. Uh, we invite many students uh, from different, uh, different backgrounds to come and work with our collections because it's important to us not to only send, but also to allow students and other people to come and interact and, and also to interpret our collections. Uh, every year, uh, the museum studies students, they uh, uh, do an intervention in our museum. And this is uh, one of the last ones they did last year on uh, a recent acquisition uh, of, the, of the museum, uh, Shapti, from the south of Egypt. Um, it's also a place for research. Uh, what you see here is also part of an exhibition, but also a research project to a CT scan and to make 3D models of our animal mummies. Here you see the crocodile being scanned. And it, of course, learns us a lot about biodiversity in the past. And so it's a very nice collaboration between the medical center in Amsterdam and the Allard Pearson and also allowing the public to interact and to, to respond to the findings. But we're also starting to go into more experimental endeavors. Uh, X Curator is a, is a project that we are doing together with um, <coughs> the Karlsruhe Museum. It's a project that is called Creative User Empowerment. It's an artificial intelligence project that uses uh, different uh, data on, on the one hand, so uh, the, our, our collection data, but also research data from the university and, and available data sets such as Wikimedia and Wikidata, Europeana, and other thesauri, and uh, 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 unleashes all, all uh, existing state-of-the-art artificial intelligence tools to then allow users to uh, dig deeper into our collections to find new uh, things that they otherwise wouldn't find because usually uh, you have to already know what you're looking for in order to find it. But this, 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 this tool, which is in development and will be, if it's ready, it will be opened, op open to everybody and all museums to use. Uh, we are very excited to see what this can bring and how well it will work. Um, and I think this is going to be an ongoing process for us. Uh, and to, to conclude, I think it's also important to uh, keep reevaluating our own collections and our own the stories that we tell about them. Um, on the left, you see a uh, uh, Pixis vase from Centuripe in Sicily. And this is one of the objects that were uh, recently uh, uh, reclaimed by uh, the Italian authorities. Uh, and this deserves a little bit of a, of a backstory, is that the archaeological collection that we have, they were academic collections, they were put together by, for teaching. Uh, but of course, we know now that a lot of these things were not always acquired in the right way. People wanted to have a very comprehensive collection and were not always, in the past, very accurate in the provenance. And now, uh, this means that we now have to look into more than 10,000 objects and trying to find out um, what is the exact provenance. And we really want to work together with the countries of origin to try and, 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 and find where they came from and, if, if possible, to, to, to restitute them. So this is also a big project for us that will take a number of years to, to carry out. Uh, on the right, you see uh, uh, an image of a theater production from the beginning of the 21st century called uh, Les Negres, or The Blacks. Uh, by Genet, and this is part of our a project on to to try and um, 
rethink the stories about our collections and to look into uh, different ways in which there was cultural bias or racism or post-colonial thinking in our own collections, the way they were put together, but also the way collections are described, the, word that, the words that we used, uh, but also to, to try and find um, new stories that are often uh, forgotten or were often forgotten because uh, yeah, uh, history is always told by the, by the victor. But we really want to be very conscious and trying to open up those collections and tell new stories and, and, and look critically at what you have done in the past. Well, thank you for listening. Um, please, the museum in Bergen. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Elia Houskin, and it is such a pleasure to be here today. And I'm thrilled to, after have seen all the wonderful things you are doing, and especially after hearing what our colleagues at the other university museums are doing, it's very inspiring. But what should a university museum be today? Our museum, the University Museum of Bergen, was founded in 1825. Right from the start, this museum project that was inspired by our founders' travels in Europe uh, was a scientific project. And back then, they wanted to classify and describe the world. Uh, so our extensive collections um, that keep growing was from the very beginning uh, organized into nat natural uh, and cultural history objects. And today, they form a very important national and international research infrastructure. And some of these millions of objects are on di display on our, in our listed museum buildings that you can see the backside of here from 1865. Is it this green button? <laughs> this one? Ah, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, so when the University of Bergen was founded uh, and it was established in 1946, it was explicitly based on the scientific activities uh, of the museum uh, and its long traditions of sharing knowledge. For us at the university, it was important to take the opportunity of a renovation to strengthen the university's ties to the society it is a part of. It seems like only yesterday that uh, we reopened Norway's oldest standing museum building after having been closed for six years. But, but six years is quite a long time because th that means that a whole generation of children have lost fond memories that all of Bergen's citizens have of spending their childhood uh, surrounded by whale skeletons, animals and beautiful objects. But we believe that we uh, might have given them something new and hopefully something better now. Because we took the renovation of this old museum building as an opportunity to rethink and redefine what a university museum could and should be today in Bergen. So in 2013, we, we say that we closed a quite traditional natural history museum, but in 19, uh, 2019, we reopened as a university museum. Okay, so I have switched some pictures, so you will just bear with me. So what do we mean by univer uh, university museum? When people visit us, when they visit, experience our exhibitions or take part in our school programs or other activities created uh, with each of our diff very different audience in mind, we let them in on the fact that the university is not an ivory tower. It's not an ivory tower where researchers are aloof and look at society through a lens or be behind a desk. A university is kind of a construction hall where the knowledge that society needs is produced. So our researchers at the University of Bergen from all different fields, they create new knowledge that can help society meet the challenges ahead. So in times where scientific knowledge have to compete with alternative facts, we want to empower, uh, empower people through an understanding of how knowledge is created. And we truly believe that society only can benefit from shared knowledge. So how do we then let our, our visitors take part in a university's knowledge production? 
And this was the picture I was supposed to show you before. But this is the structure of how we organize all our dissemination at our museum. We engage the public in questions about how scientific results are achieved. We do not only show the results, the facts, the end products of a research process, um, but we let the audience take part in what questions have the researchers posed, which sources have they used, what materials, uh, which objects have they studied, and which methods have they employed. So basically, what, uh, how do they know what they know? So we want to ask about the relevance of the research, both to, uh, we want to ask about the relevance both to the academic community and to society. And finally, what is the need for future research? Where do we, where, where do we go from here? And what does it lies around the corner? What does society need from us? So these questions, they really structure everything that we do at the University Museum now, our pedagogical programs and our activities. As a university museum, we wish to share the results of the research uh, and show that the researchers are present. They are not hidden, they are present. So we have made our museum a meeting place where researchers at the University of Bergen meet a wider public, from children to senior citizens, where current challenges are debated and the role of, uh, role of science is it's discussed. This is a place now where researchers listen as much as they talk. At least we try to make that happen. Uh, where questions are posed as much as answers given. So, so as you said, uh, we, we also are very um, interested in the curious. Because all knowledge starts with wonder, and therefore, our target group is the curious human. Those who wonder and those who want to know. Because this is the driving force be behind the wish to learn, and, the, uh, and it's, it's a quality that really defines scientists. Mobilizing our academic community, we endeavor to revitalize the ancient concept of a museum through various forms such as research-based exhibitions and school programs, as well as a wide array of events and activities. And the visitors, they take part. They test this me these methods, they work with sources, and they create knowledge. Even though this is a, a, a very, a, this is, the, our building is listed, so, but, and it gives an, an impression of being from around 1900, but it is a very highly technological building now. And uh, what we, uh, but we have tried to, when we have used digital means, we have a, a, a rule that all digital must be social. We want them to share in the experience when they do something. And of course, everything is accessible to all and in a very safe manner, I must say. So this is not, uh, but this uh, renovation project and our, all our new exhibitions, that is not an end, uh, the end of a project. We are not finished. We, this is just the beginning. Because since reopening in 2019, we have made nine new temporary um, uh, research-based uh, exhibitions together with researchers from our university. And we truly look forward to our next exhibition that will open on July 3rd, uh, no, sorry, June 3rd because that celebrates that it is 50, uh, the 50 year anniversary of the repeal of uh, what is called Section 213 in the Norwegian Penal Code, which made same-sex relations forbidden. So our exhibition is a contribution to the National Queer Cultural Year of 2022, and you are all, of course, welcome to Bergen when we open. But to conclude then, as, as a university museum, we wish to be a social arena for university and uh, public alike. We wish to awaken curiosity, to satisfy the will to know, and to inspire. And now I will stop talking. Uh, we have not so much time, but I am thinking one question for all of you. Uh, your collections came from a time when scholars went to the world, collected and classified and put all the people in taxonomies. <laughs> we, we were classified in a way. And now we are listening that you come in a new paradigm and you use words like emotions, doubt, uh, democracy, um, inclusion, uh, the idea that these collections that you are handling with 
they are not neutral. They are part of a heritage that you are presenting now. And I would like to ask all of you, how is this connecting the universities and the university collections to the uh, people around you, you? Because I know that you have many contacts international. This is part of the university, but I want to know how you work locally with the communities there. So please, you can start. <laughs> Hello. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is a um, difficult question to answer. We we try to work as many as much as possible with with local communities. Uh, I think we can still improve a lot in trying to to to, to establish these these connections. Uh, not only we have, we have done projects, for example, with. Syrian ref refugees and, and, and those kind of things. And we, we invite people to come in, for example, for an array of activities. And exa for example, these, these archaeo health hotspot always draws in lots of people. It's like a, a playground for a lot of parents who come there with their children and, and, and they can play there for hours while they're actually doing archaeological work. Uh, but I think like really establishing long-term relationships also with people outside the university, I think is really something we can still improve on. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, what is interesting now, I think we are in time of history that uh, we have to create a new history basically together with in the Netherlands with a lot of migrants and you know, that's, that come, of course, into the Netherlands because of colonial times and because of the situation in which we are at the moment in this world, unfortunately. So I think we have to create with them the new histories of the future. And saying that, I think you have to let them in also and you have to let their uh, knowledge and their expertise on their artifacts that we took maybe ages ago, you have to let that in, but also their views and, and, and different views on society, which is part of, um, well, actually the, the debate that you you started about queer uh, uh, communities, but also, of course, multicultural communities. And I think that's... Um, so beautiful that you can, because you're in a university, you can also use the knowledge of students and people that are there at this moment. So you can try to create a dialogue between society and the university. And I think that's a challenge for us, but of course for every museum and not especially for a university museum, but we have the advantage of being in the center of academia, I think. Thank you. For us, it's very important to, to, we think about school children as someone we can recruit to science. <laughs> so we work very closely with schools and uh, uh, we, we also uh, are very conscious of the fact that museums, they are meeting places. So this is a place where, where all people should be able to come. So we try to keep prices low, to have it free for children so that parents can come and have an experience that is not too, too costly. And, and uh, let people take part in the debate and, um, and, and be able to discuss knowledge when it is created. Thank you. Mm. Annie, again? Um, I think a lot's already been said, but maybe to add, um, I mean, what I see as a red line in between all our stories, uh, we focus on scientific literacy. It's no longer scientism and placing science as the next religion. It's about um, empowering our visitors and becoming scientific, uh, that they can read how science works. And you know, that starts locally, even though your scientific community is internationally, your visitors uh, and those who try to reach with the narratives that are in your collections and, with, uh, uh, and to, to bridge the, the university with society that starts locally. Um, and I think the teams that we choose, uh, Phallus or uh, the, your, your career exhibition, I mean, that starts with people in your local communities that you reach out to and you try to get those families and, and youngsters in. Um, so science is, is international, of course, but you're located uh, within a, a community uh, and a city. So um, for me, that's quite evident to, to, to start on a small scale of uh, local communities. Thank 
I would say the same, in fact. Uh, mm. So maybe a little difference uh, for us is that um, the part of art collection is quite uh, important, more important than the didactic collection or the scientific mm. collection. And if it, it is because we have been joined by a private donor, but they, they, they gave the, the, the collection because we are a university and, and for them it was mm. very important that this kind of collection is trans, transmitted, it is uh, in a sharing knowledge. And um, since our museum existing, uh, the dialogue is really what is defined us. So, um, so me meaning the dialogue between the mm. piece of heart, but also the dialogue with the user, in fact. And so we have a community uh, community of user um, with a lot of different kind of people. And students uh, are uh, the one who. Um, come to the museum for the seminar, but there will be the one also to be curator. And we have also artists en résidence project mm -hmm. with artists and researchers, and they are working inside the museum with the collection and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's um, projects uh, appeal on other projects and so on. And so we learn about that. So uh, that's mm -hmm. it. Yes, it is very enthusiastic. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. I think that it's the time for the next group. So please. So it's my pleasure to introduce you the last uh, session today. Uh, we are free museums, and the thing that is common to all these museums is uh, just the ownership, and it's a private museum's group. So please, uh, Finnish, museum, uh, Finnish Music Museum fame. Voila. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, then we have in web uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, Helga de Alveare. I hope it went almost correct. <laughs> And then we have a uh, Victoria Museum from uh, Kiev, almost. But I can see that the Music Museum fame is ready. Introduce the group also, I hope. Hello, everybody, dear colleagues and museum friends. Uh, I'm Mikko Vanni, the chairman of the board for the Music Museum fame in Helsinki, Finland. We have a great team here, Olli, the CEO and co-founder. Founder. Uh, I, I hope that you are still awake. Jere, we try to keep you awake. Jere, uh, our content director and consulting from the Helsinki City Museum. Then Nina, co-founder and uh, also member of the board. Jukka somewhere. Uh, representative from, from our content group and the researcher, and then Elina and Eero, who are from the National Museum. Elina, Elina is the chairman of uh, our advertise, uh, advising committee, and uh, also Eero is in the committee. So we have a big group here today. We are extremely honored uh, to be here in EMEA among all of you. Thank you very much. And we are uh, very honored to be in this group with the uh, Victoria Museum from Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the artistic part of our logo is made in 1981 by my father, Sambvanni, who was a member of Finnish Academy and European Academy. I doubt that any of your logos are, have been in planning process for 38 years. <laughs> How on earth four entrepreneurs started uh, thinking to uh, build a museum? There is a simple answer. We knew how to make a big project and we love culture and we love music. I have a secret for you actually. The Finnish music is well known internationally. 
You know Sibelius, a very famous composer. Then only a century after that, we got uh, this monster band Lordi, who won the Eurovision Song Contest in 2006, and now uh, Music Museum fame as a nominee here. Now, uh, we really have a lot of lot of artists and musicians, and uh, you are able to see them and, and get to know them better when coming to our museum. Uh, music, music Museum fame invites you to enjoy all kinds of Finnish music. The idea of the muse museum was conceived in 2015, and in 2019 it found its place as part of the huge new mall, Mall of Tripla in central Helsinki. The location is perfect and easily accessible by all means of transport. Outside the museum building is separate, but inside the museum opens to the mall. We welcomed over 40,000 visitors during the first five months before the pandemic started in March. 2020. The museum is a private initiative and thus one of the most difficult and challenging tasks was to raise all the necessary funding. This multitude of logos makes visible the number of main and other partners representing technology, media, other sponsors and institutional partners such as Ministry of Culture, Finnish National Museum and City of Helsinki. A unique feature in our museum concept is our approach to collecting. We chose not to create our own collection, but to co collaborate with the Finnish National Museum and Finnish Heritage Agency. We agreed to outsource the collection and conservation of museum objects to the National Museum, which has reduced our costs and given us access to highest professional level of conservation. Thanks to the cooperation, the National Museum founded a new popular music collection and has already been able to include numerous interesting objects to it. Uniquely in the world, Finnish Music Hall of Fame covers all musical genres from rock to classical music. New members are selected annually by the nomination committee. All exhibits are from artists, collectioners and museums. Finnish Music Hall of Fame is the first culture-related Hall of Fame concept in Finland, respecting musicians' long careers from all eras. And uh, this concept could be adapted to any country. It has been really extremely interesting to see that how, for example, the members of Nightwish, a uh, legendary band, uh, heavy music band is so happy to be in the same group as Sibelius or some other old Finnish music legends. Music Museum fame offers easily accessible information, pictures, videos and music highlighting the musical evolution of Finland and the careers of over 250 musicians. They are presented on touch screens in a special room seen in the picture. The digital content of these touchscreens is organized and exhibited through our innovative play fame platform. Modern technology allows new means to evoke and understand the strong emotional impact that music has as an element of both individual and national identities. The soul of the Finnish music is visualized in this space presenting different themes, for example, nature. The visitors are invited to enjoy music actively, for instance, for instance singing virtual karaoke, learning to dance ballet, or diving into harmonies like a conductor. Our innovation, the virtual karaoke, includes over 80,000 songs both national and international, which the visitor may sing on six different stages or sites. And this could be adapted to any country as well. 
The orchestra room with the immersive voice system motivates the visitor to conduct an orchestra and listen how chosen individual instruments are highlighted. Music Museum fame has created a wide network of music institutions and individual musicians and researchers, which has made several fruitful exhibition projects possible. Our newest exhibition was opened last week, and it is dedicated to children's music. We have a high-quality restaurant with both indoor and outdoor seating, which has provided a cozy setting for many popular small-scale concerts. There is also a museum shop with fame and uh, music-related products. The museum has been warmly welcomed by the Finnish music scene. Thanks to this, we have managed to create a comprehensive network of cultural organizations, individual artists and researchers. This enables us, for instance, to exhibit rarely seen treasures from the private collections of musicians and their heirs. We also have produced exhibitions in cooperation with music institutions and thus offered them a space and new means to make their work and heritage accessible to a wider audience. Despite the challenging pandemic years, our museum is full of energy with the inspiring exhibitions and professional stuff. We welcome all of you to visit Music Museum Fame in Helsinki to enjoy a compact package of unique content and atmosphere with visual sound. Thank you. Do we have a Museum of Contemporary Art uh, online? Yes. Hello, Clara. Hello. Hello, good afternoon from Museum of Contemporary Art Helga Dalvear in the Spanish city of Cáceres in Extremadura. We are honored to be part of the celebration and we are sorry that we have not been able to join you in person due to uh, unexpected injury. It has been truly inspiring and enriching to listen to all of you and we feel very proud to be part of this diverse, creative, innovative and socially committed community of European museums. Um, just one second, because my presentation, there you go. Um, here in Cáceres, thanks to Helga de Alvear, the support of Extremenian institutions, and above all, thanks to our community and our visitors, we have been able to create a space where everybody feels welcome to enjoy contemporary art. As Marcel Duchamp would say, contemporary art is for everybody, but not everybody knows it. And Helga de Alvear Museum is here to solve that. This museum has only been possible because of the generosity of Helga de Alvear herself, who is donating the collection that she has been cultivating during her entire lifetime to all of us. She understands art collection as a private activity with a public purpose. Therefore, she collects not to possess the art pieces, but to preserve them and share them with as many people as possible. So hopefully we feel the same passion that she feels towards the art of our present. With over 3,000 artworks by more than 500 artists spanning the five continents, the collection constitutes an extended at plural family of artworks undergoing constant transformation as a museum itself. Uh, because it continues to grow through new acquisitions uh, and new gifts from Helga every year. We hold artists such as Kandinsky, Louis Bourgeois, Picasso, Aibebe, Olafur Eliasson, and along, etc. It is considered one of the most important private contemporary art collections in Europe, and now it has become public as a precious gift for all of us and for all art lovers and art curious. The institution started over 10 years ago as a visual art center in a rehabilitated Art Nouveau building. And last year, in February 2021, it became a museum with the inauguration of a whole new building that was tailor-made to host the collection and the museum activities. Designed by Tunyan Architectos, the new building is aimed at blurring boundaries. As you can see, it occupies the imaginary line that separates the historical district of Cáceres, a World Heritage Site, 
from the modern part of the city. Um, as a central part of the project, a public walkway redistributes the area urbanistically and extends public space, improving access to a part of the city that was not very well connected before. Access to the museum, guided tours, and the hundreds of activities that we offer are free of charge, always, as per Helga's desire. We strongly believe that the museum mission is not only about preserving and exhibiting the artworks, but to offer new ways to understand our present, share ideas, and offer creative tools to raise our own voices and develop critical thinking. In this case, for example, uh, we can see how the work by Francisco de Goya, Los Caprichos, one of our masterpieces, is still relevant nowadays to approach social, political, and intellectual issues, bringing them back to present by our youngest audience or the adults of the future, like we like to call them. Just one second. Ah, we have a, uh, yeah. Helga de Alvear democratizes access to culture in an inclusive way and helps to generate new paths to build cooperation networks. We have built strategic partnerships with different associations and key actors in our community to co-design activities, workshops, materials. And for example, here we are seeing just one of the many examples where we team up with an association to celebrate diversity uh, with an art workshop inspired by one of the artworks of the collection by Katarina Grosse. We encourage everybody to be part of the museum truly by bringing their own sensibilities and experience. Uh, here in this case, for example, we see some image of the installation of one of the most iconic artworks of the museum, that is the Sending Light by the artist and activist Ibe Bay. Um, and we invite some of the local high schools to help us in Sally during the inauguration, pre during the installation process. So they were able to join us even before the museum inaugurated. And this is the result. Um, the artworks in the collection help us about to create new dialogues about the city we want to live in, about freedom of speech, about sustainable and ecology uh, with this uh, temporary exhibition, for example, of Desert Voice that we recently had, identity, respect, memory, experiences, and the endless freedom that art and culture offer us uh, to keep growing together and looking at the future. We believe in the power of art as a tool for social change, and we wanted to finish our presentation standing in solidarity with Ukraine and with our fellow museum that comes next. Um, based on an artwork by Spanish artist Santiago Sierra, we wanted to share with you this symbolic act to say no to violence, no to terror, not to destruction, not to the nonsense of any war. And let's hopefully just say yes to culture, and to solidarity and the power of museums to create new futures together. Thank you so much for your time. So next one, uh, it's an honor to present Victoria Museum, Victoria Lusenko. Yes. And uh, communication um, director, head, <laughs> Olga Tatsi. My name is Victoria Lysinka. I'm the founder and the creator of Victoria Museum uh, of Costume and Style in Kiev. Uh, my speech and will be presentation, no? Uh, my speech and presentation, these are two separate, separate creation. <laughs> yes. I opened the door of the museum in 2017, when there was war in the east of Ukraine. This step was my response to the events in the country, and I had and still have the belief there is culture, there we build peace. In 2019, I was visited by Wim van der Weyden, the expert from the European Museum Academy. He was curious to find out how in the three years it was possible to create a museum from scratch. Curious how without budgetary money, but only driven by huge intention and passion of one person to make such an ultra-modern museum. I remember that he was amazed as 
what she saw. In one of the conversation, he suggested to me that my museum is a museum of one hour. This is a relevant format in our time. The reviews of our guests confirm this. They spend one hour of quality time with their families to be filled with cultural leisure to learn the history of Ukraine before 1920 to see and feel how the intelligentsia lived, which had trends and had an impact. This way, they get life impression that raise their index of happiness. It is through dresses and costumes that a visitor can easily plunge into the history of prominent personalities of Ukraine of that time, for example, writers Lesia Ukrainka and Olga Kobelianska, composers Mikola Lysenka and Mikola Leontovich, opera diva Salamia Krushelnitskaya, and many, many others. Over the five years of my activity, I have held 14 exhibitions, published five catalogs, two specialized magazines, held a lot of events aimed at supporting Ukrainian culture and studying the history of Ukraine. As a result of this work, visitors began to call the Victoria Museum a visiting card of Kiev. On the 7th of April, during the war, after long internal hesitation, I decided to open the doors of my museum again, for free, for everyone. It was dangerous and risky. 50 people visited the museum on the first day. For many, this was a breath of fresh air, a time to feel inner peace. A girl from destroyed Mariupol wrote in the book recalling that it was her best day in the last 45 days. <laughs> I cried with happiness that my museum, my life's work, mess makes a significant contribution to Ukraine identity to the culture front now. I invite all of you, after the victory, to visit Kyiv and the Victoria Museum. I believe and know that visiting Ukraine will become a fashion trend for the next decade. This is why it is extremely important for me to stand on this stage, because I'm from Ukraine, and the brand I'm from Ukraine is a brand of democracy, courage, and freedom. Thank you. So we have the panel with the three the most different museums what you could ever imagine. One museum has decided to build the museum where the people are in Helsinki, to the shopping center with their own building. One museum has, has decided to build a new contemporary art critical museum. And one is a private collection which has been collected for years in the old building. And let's hope that it will be open there and it will stay open for the years. I have to ask about uh, some of your um, project plannings. I think the, the main question is that you have different topics, you have very different strategies, how you manage the museums. Uh, I think the first question is how do you find your audiences? How, which has been the challenge if you are just coming from, from the scratch, as Victoria was putting before? How do you, how, how you have built it in so few years? where you have also had COVID. So what has been the challenge for your content? Yes. This works. Yeah, uh, to be honest, of course, it was uh, <laughs> not so easy. So the, the great start, what we what we had was, was uh, absolutely good. So we had... Uh, until Feb we opened actually October and uh, until uh, February we had already over 40,000 uh, visitors. But of course then everything collapsed. But uh, why, why we did so and why, why we started, we started actually planning uh, 2015 already and we opened uh, 2019 and it was, uh, it was uh, <clears throat> passion of, uh, 
of uh, music. So we are we are music lovers, and and we were looking for for the new ways to to build up something new. That's why we also contacted to the National Museum to find uh, a different way to do this and and how we can how we can be at uh, the the high level, high high international level, and and also the content and and uh, technology was also one. Uh, one thing we decided already then, so we wanted to be uh, more digital, uh, 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 more te technology orientated, but but still the uh, the uh, uh, museum items uh, they are very important to us. I can add to this that uh, <clears throat> we have uh, very good relations to the uh, uh, media. Uh, we have some media partners which give us quite a lot of exposure, uh, especially now during the first. Uh, starting year uh, and uh, and still there are uh, big medias uh, as our partners and then we also succeeded quite well uh, getting uh, communication with uh, media events and uh, and uh, our communication letters to to media so so that's perhaps another part of the answer thank you uh. We uh, do a lot of things uh, in the uh, digital sphere and uh, when museum was closed uh, because of lockdown, uh, Victoria made uh, a series of uh, video and uh, it was uh, short videos uh, which uh, uh, told about uh, exponents of museum and um, uh, it called uh, into museum for one minute and uh, during one minute uh, Victoria told about uh, uh, the most interesting exponents and uh, f uh, with uh, this uh, project we uh, connect with uh, aud auditory uh, offline and then when museum was open uh, these people came to museum and uh, they was amazing to see it uh, uh, by their eyes and um, uh, we uh, use uh, a lot of um, we work with uh, social media and uh, we are very active in uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook and we know that a lot of uh, people uh, come to a museum uh, from social media and uh, we try to be creative uh, to, <laughs> to uh, talk about uh, our, our work. And uh, uh, even now, when uh, in Ukraine is the most difficult situation, we opened, uh, Victoria opened uh, the door of museum uh, for free for everyone who is in Kyiv now and uh, for Kievans and uh, other people from another uh, cities of Ukraine. And uh, Victoria told that uh, it was uh, uh, 50 people in the first day, uh, but now we see that uh, this uh, uh, number uh, only grow up. And um, uh, in this time, we uh, invite volunteers who make master classes, lectures about uh, connection past with a few with a day uh, today and uh, uh, lectures uh, about uh, uh, our exhibits and uh, about uh, what exhibits can can talk uh, about this situation uh, in Ukraine and uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, a lot of people uh, come to here, come to us uh, uh, to uh, these uh, lectures and, and these events. Clara, your, uh, yes. your museum and wider audiences. I know you are also exceptional that you are having pedagogical... We have been program. very surprised. <laughs> yeah, we've been very surprised and we are so thankful for the city of Cáceres first and then the international community coming. But it was a challenge because we opened the doors of the new building in February 2021, and here in Cáceres we had travel restrictions. People from, not even from other communities around us could come visit us. 
So we opened the museum just for the people of the city. That was also very beautiful as well, because it was the first ones our neighbors coming to see what was happening. All the time slots were, were full during the first days, but we felt sorry because we couldn't host as many people as, as we could, as we, as we would like to, because we had to be very careful uh, and putting restrictions due to the sanitary situation. Um, it also helped us to think in this new term, uh, global, that we all uh, hear so much, that in this case it was very accurate because we had to act locally and think globally. And it really helped us to develop, and I think it's now in our DNA, DNA to, to be the, this way. Um, it was a challenge at the beginning because, of course, we, we couldn't do the, the activities with as many people as we could. Um, but it has been also very rewarding because we think like in difficult circumstances, people really can find an oasis. And especially in contemporary art, it can help us to, to go out from only our own individuality and think of our own problems and, and offer a window to other realities and to start thinking in, in our community that we all share in, in our present, in our context. Um, and now we are very happy because uh, we, we are becoming, we, can, we are showing that art can become a tool for economical development, but above all for cultural development and sharing experiences uh, with no frontiers. So uh, regarding our public, we, we just can say thank you to everybody who just come visit us in this last year and looking forward to, to see more and more visitors enjoying contemporary art for the first time or for the thousand time uh, very soon. Then I have to ask for the last question because we have one um, person sitting without saying nothing. Uh, uh, that uh, how. We had a talk how the fashion and the, the art can can be for audiences. But what about the music? We all love music. We all listen a lot of music. But how to present the music in the exhibition? What does it really mean as a challenge for very wide audiences, as your museum also has? Yeah, music as a museum object is quite challenging because it's immaterial, immaterial. And in most music museums, it is presented with musical instruments. And in our case, as we don't have any collection, so we chose it differently. So we took musical material and made it visual. So you have to see something at the museum. And that's why we have so much digital material, so many films, so many videos, so many photographs, just to make it visual and also use the space and all, all kinds of effects to enhance the, for, the strength of music. And uh, also as we took all kinds of music in Finland as a subject, so that allowed us also to find uh, new combinations to cross boundaries. And that was our aim that we cover over 100 years of music in Finland and all kinds of styles. And for sure, that music, uh, there's, there's music for everyone and also music that is unknown to everyone. And what is our, our aim is to, to, to encourage people to cross their own boundaries and find new music and in a way make it easy, surprise people. And that way, it was quite challenging and also very rewarding to work with music as a subject without a collection. So without mm -hmm. those instruments, but with just music as a starting point. Voila. Let's make a big applause to our last session. And I will make one small comment that we are all ex expected to come uh, out from the dark room to the left side of, or central side of the museum, we call it bridge, for a welcoming reception and a concert. And I have a wish for all the museums who are presenting tomorrow, please send as soon as possible your slides. <laughs> Technical team would love you much, much more if you do that. <laughs> But I wish you a good evening and uh, we meet here tomorrow in this room again, nine o'clock.